right here. Right here, yeah. So, um, yeah, and it is hard because we don't have something that does translate or, you know, exactly to that.
Yeah. All right, how's everybody doing? Say my Zoom in the day. Oh, it's a large Zoom world today. We should be Zoom today. We should be Zoom today. Okay. Uh, hold on. I'm going to cook and get it. The sword is looking good. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for your company like that. I should buy another one like this. No, it's like a different style. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's a winter one. Yeah, it's a winter one. Yeah, yeah it's like a winter one. All right. 
Um, I have a question for yes. the case study. Yes. One of the group, the uh, master mm -hmm. Yeah. This one person. Yeah. Okay. All right. See, so got a deep Zoom class today. How's everybody doing on Zoom? Uh, we did. Yeah. Let me see. I got Laura, Jack, Christina, Love Free, Sachiko, Yeah, you. Yeah. Hello. Okay, good. I'm glad you guys didn't make it. All right. Doesn't matter. Here or Zoom, it's okay with me. All right. Any questions before we start this week? Uh, nothing? Anybody? Sound good? Good. Everybody go on the case study? Yeah. All right, all right. Um, so we at week five, yeah, week five, so more than halfway through. So, good job. Three more weeks, and then we'll be out of here and done. Okay, so this week we're going to talk about training, and training is one of those things where HR really has a big role as far as really just managing and coordinating the training, they don't really decide what type of training goes on, except for mandatory training, that I think. Except for what we call mandatory training. Okay. So when we're talking about mandatory training, we're just really talking about training that has to happen, right? Whether it be sexual harassment, equal opportunity training, um, racial discrimination training, whatever it is, right? Some, there's some training that's mandatory uh, on the government, you know, uh, by the government saying, hey, that needs this type of training, but we don't want them to work, but we want to make sure everybody understands, like, hey, these particular rules and how to conduct themselves, right? So there's that training. But it's also training that's more focused on organizational goals, right? And then also there's an aspect of personal goals, right? We want to have training that is not only going to benefit the company, but also going to benefit you in the long run, right? Because if you decide not to take the company, that's okay, right? But you need to really take a skill set that you learn from the company, right? Because you should learn everywhere you go, right? And take something new with you, and then move on to something else bigger and better, okay? Doesn't mean the company's bad or anything like that. It just means that maybe they don't have the opportunity there that you can get from something else, right? They don't have a, a position open, right? But the training is important, and if you go to a job, and they don't offer you any professional development, no training whatsoever on a personal level, then you probably want to find another job. Okay. Because the key really for me as a leader, for you as a leader, for you working in a corporation or any entity, is to train and get better. All right. And so if you're not giving me that particular opportunity to train and learn a new skill set or learn a new, you know, technique or any, you know, just to name new knowledge, then I just want to be doing the same job over and over again, right? And I really know how to do it. It's going to be to burn out. Yeah, it's going to be burn out, right? You're going to be bored. You're going to be doing other things. You, you know, you get there at 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, you're done with your work. And then what do you do for the rest of the time, right? They don't want to give you nothing else. You're like, well, I need to do something more, right? So training, you know, is an important aspect where we try to make sure that, hey, we give the employees of the workforce a new skill set, a new base of knowledge, new insight into something, right? Again, to add value to the organization because they're normally tied to objective or the mission of the, of the company, right? So we want to do that. But at the same time, we understand that there's a benefit that needs to be had to the participant, right? There's there be some incentive for you, some reason for you to want to train, right? And so that's an important aspect of it all. We try to put it together make sure that you only got get good training but it's you know it's insightful it's valuable all right and you can take it with you and for the most part we want to be able to apply the training right away all right you learn something this week more than likely i want you to employ it in your day-to-day -day job you know the following week as soon as you get back hey show me what you learned what was what, what this you know excel class about what was this you know um you know gap class about, um, you know, what was this engineering class about, right? That you learned about something new, right? Show me how it's going to improve your work, right? Improve your 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 day-to-day -day activities and provide efficiency or make the company better, right? What did you bring to the table? 
Okay. So organization strategy and, tra and training, 2002, training, investment and training, organizational competitors, right? As things that when you look at training, what do they bring to the table? Right? Why would a company be interested in training? If I have people that already know what they're doing, why don't you train them anymore? Okay. Because we change every day. Okay. We're changing as we sit here. The world is changing, right? By the minute. Okay. And so in order to keep up with the change, you have to train, right? And training could be informal, formal, you know, it could be in any type of setting. You could you can train and sitting at home in, you know, in your, in your bed or watching TV. You could be training and learning something new at the same time, right? I know some people study and they, they learn things, but the TV's on, the radio's on, everything's on, kids, family, running around, right? You can train any time, right? But the point is that we want you to get better. So that you can do better at work. So doing better at work leads to high productivity, efficiency, which has a direct impact on the bottom line. Okay, that's the end of the day what we're trying to do. All right. All right. So some key thinking. All right. So. Uh, Okay, so training, when we think about it, right, from a strategic sense. So a lot of managers, like, say, let's say you're at a job and you're not doing too great, right? You're okay, but the manager's not happy with you, the boss is not happy with you, right? In most instances, the manager will say, oh, you need more training, okay? Which is not always the case, right? Usually, if you're not doing well, it's going to be bored, right? The work is too easy or the work too hard. You don't understand what you're doing. There's no communication as far as guidance. Like, what do you want me to do? Like, what is it you're looking for, right? There's none of that. Or there's other things going on, colleagues, right? The work environment is not really all that great. You know, you talk to, yeah, you have a tough time with your relationship with your boss and some other people. And so you don't even like to go to work. When you get there, you do the bare minimum and you're, you're gone, right? And so your manager sees that as not being um, a good worker and may send you to training or may think you need training when you don't need training, right? And so this is the thing that you have to kind of avoid from the strategic level of thinking that training can fix everything because it can't. Training is not the band aid, training is not the fix, right? Nine times out of 10, it's a personality conflict. It's a conflict in relationship. It's a matter of sitting down, talking, seeing eye to eye, setting expectations, right, on both ends that we both understand, like, okay, this is what I expect you as a boss. This is what I expect of you as a mm -hmm. worker and employee, right? We both have expectations. You have your expectations. This is what I think, you know, you should be doing for me and helping me out with. And these are the things that I need you to do and, and perform to, right? And so we have to make sure that expectations meet. When expectations don't meet, this is where we run into the issue, right? Because you're expecting one thing, your boss is expecting something else, and nobody gets really what they want, trying to get something in the middle that could be okay, right? But really, based on your personality and who you are, you might get nothing out of it. You know, but heartburn and it's starting to stress you out, physically starting to, you know, manifest itself. You can see it in, you know, your how you, you wake up in the morning, how you feel during the day, how you're eating. Just, you know, you don't want to really do anything because you're worried about work and all the things you have to do for work. So it starts to manifest itself. The thing is that your boss is your boss. And unfortunately, you have to do kind of, you know, what they want, what how they want it. They say. Yeah. As long as it's not illegal, it's okay, right? Because we all have our preferences. You do it one way, doesn't necessarily mean I would do it that way, right? Neither way is right or wrong, right? But at the same time, this is why I like it. This is why I want to see it. So I, I want you to do it that way. That may be something that you have to learn, right? You may not know how to do it that way. You may not know how to do a pivot table. If I want a pivot table. Okay, well, guess what? You got to stay in training so that you can understand how to make a pivot table, right? How to do V lookup. And I'm talking about Excel stuff, stuff, right? How to do all that stuff. Like, I don't know how to do it. All right. Well, I got to change training because that's the way I want to see it. Okay. But most times, training doesn't really fix any real issues 
within the workplace, right? Because those issues are usually personality relationship issues, right? So from a strategic stand standpoint, the reason we train is to um, make the entire workforce better, okay? And then what does that lend us to? Does that lend us to say, hey, we want to, you know, be overseas or be a multinational corporation in the next three, five years? What do we need to have? Well, we probably need to have some cultural awareness training. We probably need to have some, you know, foreign exchange training. We probably need to have some language training, right? Customs and courtesy training, right? What, what happens to the, when you go to these countries that we want to set up shopping, right? If we go to the Middle East, how do we act? Right? Not not work stuff, but more cultural stuff, right? Behavioral stuff, right? You can't do this, you can't do that, or you can't do this, or this is not gonna happen, you're not gonna see that over there, right? Just like when you come to the United States, there's some cultural training, some stuff that you you know you have to kind of be um talked about, discussed, because it's not the same everywhere. Come on in. Come on, then you Um, it's not the same everywhere, right? So when you come to the United States, and hey, look. The United States is not, you know, it's safe, but it's not as safe as other places. Okay? You got to keep your eyes open, your ears open, listen to stuff, watch people, right? Don't trust people, right, that you don't know. Okay? Because in other countries, you can. Other countries say, somebody says, hey, let me help you. They want to help you. In the United States, somebody says, let me help you. <laughs> that's not always the case. Okay? We got some crazy people here. All right? So you got to watch out for that stuff, right? But it's part of the training. You know what right. I'm saying? It's part of training. Nothing to do with work, right? It's just training that we need to get you uh, acclimated to what's going on because we want to expand into a different market, all right? So if we want to expand into the market, what kind of training do we need to do? And strategically, that's the kind of way you think about training. What goal is it attached to? Is there a training event going on, right? Oh, okay. Is there a training event going on, training? Right. What objective is it? Hi, what objective? What is what mission? What what goal? Organizational goal is it attached to? Right? It needs to be attached to something. All of them do. Right? Training one, training two, training three. Each one needs to be attached to some organizational objective, organizational goal for us to move forward. I just don't want to be giving you training for no reason. Why would I train you? If it's not going to benefit me, also, okay, and you got to remember that about the, the company, they're not going to do anything out of the kindness of their hearts. They're doing something, they're going to get expect something back, all right. And the thing that they're going to get back is someone who cannot speak Italian, who cannot speak Russian, who cannot speak Chinese, and good luck with that, but you know, who can now speak, you know, a little bit of Arabic, you know, like that's what you're going to get. Someone who kind of understands enough to get us by to make that connection, that business connection for us, right? So you see how the personal development turned into a business thing now, right? Yes, was it good for you to learn a different language and learn different cultures? Sure, because now you know more and you can travel to those countries, you have a little more insight, but also it helps you like, oh, guess what? We have the deal that's going down. We need someone who's, you know, good in Arabic or good in French or good in Italian. We trained you. you. You're the lead. You got it. Okay? It's your project now. And whatever it is, however strong your time is, whatever, you get by, but you got the training, right? And also, the, the, the thing is, on the other side, they're doing the same type of training, right? So you meet in the middle. It's not like you're just going and whoever you're training uh, or whoever your, your, your counterpart is. Is not is not trained up also because they get trained in the customs and courtesies of the United States, right? Or the host country that they're dealing with, right? And so the training is a two way street on that end. But that's just an example. But I wanted to make sure that how you understood strategic training different from when you get down to the mid level, more uh, workplace training, right? Organizational training and that kind of thing. All right. Okay, so. The biggest thing here really is that when it comes to training, the money that's spent is really um, spent on instructors, okay? Getting the right person to teach your classes and instruct your, your workplace, okay? And it's important because 
if I'm spending, like training is expensive. So for instance, I own a consulting company, right? So I go and I do executive coaching, I do team dynamics um, and things like that, all right? For four or five hours, depending on how many people there are, about $10,000. That's how much I charge, okay? Yeah. If it's more than that, it can get up to $25,000, okay? There's a lady, I can't remember her name right now. She charges $25,000 for one hour. Wow. For her to come in and talk to you and sit down and it's up to $25,000 an hour. I mean, uh, yeah, basically it's $25,000 an hour. Yeah. Well, that's cool. No, if she gets it, she booked. Like, she, why? she gets it all day. Why? Because the information, the training she's providing is useful. All right? If you get executive coaching one on one training, right? It's different where you know you get you get to ask more questions, it's more personalized. It's not really focused on you and not anybody else, right? If I'm doing a team type training, everybody gets a little bit of something because of other stuff that I that I do and kind of just reports and there's assessments like the the, the Meyer break test you took uh what a couple of weeks ago, was the last week two weeks ago, the MBTI. I have things like that that you take and it'll give you a report and it'll tell you what kind of person you are, sort of like related to how you work. Okay, that's what I'm talking about, related to how you work. Not necessarily, it, it could probably provide inside of who you are as a person, also, because the training I do also, people take it and use it at home with their kids and their families, and they use it at work too, because it really tells you something about how you work, how you approach things, how you problem solve. How you deal with challenges and that kind of thing, right? But it's expensive for companies, okay? It's expensive. So if I'm paying that much money for a training session, I need to be sure that the instructor is good. Yes. Okay? The instructor, it has to be vetted, has to be someone that is reputable, has to be someone that I can see the training. Because usually before you get you know training, you go in. And you do a session, right? You do a free session for the executives or whoever, right? And then they, they like it, then cool, right? But they feel like it's a little short somewhere and it's not really worth their money and they can get something better, something else. They won't spend the money. But most times, once the training is established, kind of like, you know, you guys have done 360 disc, no? Uh, well, you guys did MDT dot, right? Mm -hmm. the data. So, before that used to be something where you know people would come in, give you know, this assessment, and then they would have a whole course, you know, a whole training seminar behind it, right? Now we just go online and you know you can take it for free and that kind of thing, right? And you can follow the thing, you can see it, you can read yourself what it is that you you know it says you know your characteristics are, right? Uh, but sometimes you like a further breakdown, right? There's more to the MBTI than what you guys got. Right, there's a, there's a whole other factor to it, right? And so when you have these training, uh, you know, uh, venues, um, they're expensive, and people want to make sure that the instructor is correct. Because if I pay twenty five thousand dollars and I put ten people in the room, I expect them to walk out with some new skill set that they can apply as soon as they get back to their desk. Okay, as soon as they get back to the office, I expect to see what you learn, how can you apply it, how does it make us better? Okay, and so it's important that the instructor who's doing the you know the, the, the teaching and the, the training, I want to know that you are well versed in what you're doing. Okay, and secondly, there's a lot of things when it comes to this learning, right? What we call pedagogy, pedagogy. Right, pedagogy is basically the science of learning. Right, how do people learn? Because that's really the essence of training. How do you learn? Like for me, I'm a visual or what we call tactile learner. You have to touch things. Right, I gotta do. Right, I just can't read a, a, a formula and then go apply it. I see the formula great, but I need the data set. I know the formula. Yeah, I have to try it. Right, I have to experiment with. It. I have to go through this. Go through the pain of doing that. Mm -hmm. Other people are auto learners. learning. They hear stuff and then it's like people that are good at music, right? Mm -hmm. Music by ear, mm -hmm. right? They can't read music. They hear it though. 
and they're just fine, right? There's a lot of musicians out there, big stars, they don't know how to read music. They can't read music sheet, but they they know it. They can hear it and they can play it just fine, just by tone, right? So they're auditory learners. Other people are visual learners, right? Other people, you know, kind of, most people are, are, are typically a hybrid of, you know, visual, auditory, and tactile, right? And perhaps application, depending where you get tactile at. But for the most part, you have to figure out what works as far as delivery, okay? From, a, from an instructor standpoint. The problem is that if I have a room, even this room is small, you know, small of us here, or five of us here, and then we got our people on Zoom, right? Each one of you learn differently. So how do I build something, right? What, what process am I gonna use to make sure that I reach everybody here, okay? And so the consensus, is that hey, we're gonna do PowerPoint. We're gonna do lecture format. Okay. And we have also online format, right? In online format, we have autonomous, right? Or we have monitored or proctored or whatever the case may be, right? If you have an autonomous course, that means it's just online strictly. And what I do is post a video of my lecture and you are on your own time, and that's that, right? Vice this is more hybrid where you know, students can come into the class, they can talk to me, they can quote me, but we're still online, right? Technology has helped us do that. We couldn't do this before. Ten years ago, there's no way we'd be doing this, right? We'd be absent. Yeah. Okay, this wouldn't happen. So you have to make sure that you pay attention to you know the instructor and what the instructor does and pay because it's a big cost, it's a lot of money, especially in a big company, because you're not, especially if you have like not only mandatory training, but then training that is, you know, skill, but a skill that everyone should have, it starts to get priced, right? And so imagine you have a company that has 10,000 workers, right? How do I train all these people, right? To make sure they understand what it is I need from them. Now there's different avenues, of course, you know, we'll, we'll send it to you via email, like here's the link, go to the website, do it yourself. But again, is that going to give me the valuable training that I want? Is that going to give me the, the transfer of learning that I want, the transference, right? So in order for learning to happen, we have to have transference. It has to be a transfer of knowledge, right? And the way I know that it's a transfer of knowledge is that if I, let's just say you came in here tonight and I give you a test, right? And then you guys took the test and everybody did bad, right? And then I lectured, talked a little bit, and I give you the test again tomorrow. Everybody did better. I, that way I know learning was transferred, okay? You learn something, the knowledge is transferred, right? If there's no transfer of knowledge, then there was no learning. If you come back tomorrow and you get the same score, then you didn't learn anything. Right? Nothing happened. I'm just wasting my time. You wasted your time. We're just sitting here looking at each other. Okay. <laughs> now I might I like looking at you guys, but not that much. <laughs> All right. So there's no transfer of learning. So transfer transference is a big, big thing when learning, right? Because I need you to understand it and then you to apply it. Right? Because again, you have to go back and apply it to your day-to-day -day task, right? How are you gonna employ it? Right? And the instructor has a big, big part to do with it um, because they're the ones that are giving you um, the lesson. Okay. All right. So now let's think through strategy and training. All right. So when it comes down to um, why companies particularly do training, all right, from each aspect. Okay. So from organizational strategy, right, we kind of already talked about a little bit, right? But you might want to increase sales. There might be some new product coming that we want to train on employees on, right? Sales jobs, they're always training, okay? Because there's always a new product, there's always a new feature to a product because you have to be explained to the customer, mm -hmm. right? So sales guys are always in training because they have to understand the product intimately, all right? Because if, even if they have a, a demonstration, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, they, they have, have a demonstration, demonstration yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were demonstrated, right? Even more so, right? Mm -hmm. Now you gotta show them how to do it live. If you don't know what you're doing, you're gonna look pretty dumb, 
it's gonna be bad, right? I'm not gonna buy this product because you don't know what you're doing. You can't explain to me what does this do? Oh, what are you not doing this? Well, okay, I'm not gonna spend ten thousand dollars and you just say does that. I need a more detail, I need more information, right? So training is always, you know, kind of linked in with the sales, right? New product line. Right now, when it comes down to you know what it is you're looking for, right? When it comes to training, right? I'm looking for people that are increased knowledge base. Okay, I'm looking for maybe an increase in revenue. I'm looking for increase in customer satisfaction. Okay, this is where you can tell when some of the training is taking place. Is it taking root? Is it is it working? You may have a, a bad customer service. Right, say hey, we're doing a training activity. All right, I'm going to simulate a customer and you're going to take my order and just do what you normally do. All right, and then it's terrible. And it's okay, this is what we want you to do. This is why In and Out, Chick fil A, this is why their customer service is the way it is because they train. They train all the time. New employees come in, hey, this is, this is the culture of our business. All right, and so you're not going to automatically pick that up because that may not be your personality. Okay, that's the other thing. Just because the organization is a certain way doesn't mean that you're a certain way. You have to remember that you still are yourself. You still are an individual person. You're still unique. But you're here working, and I need you to behave this way. Okay? Yes. Is the person not nice? Is the person rude? Yeah, they probably maybe they were, all right? But your training tells you, like, uh, you know what? Sorry, we get the order right. Let me fix that for you. What do you need? Make sure the customer's happy and they leave, right? Even if they were being stupid about it, right? Because you have to put that aside. You have to put your emotion aside and understand that people have frustration as consumers because they're spending their money and they don't get what they want or they what they expect. They're going to take it out on you. Even though you had nothing to do with it, right? It's not my room, mister. Okay? I just work here. Not my room. But let me see what I can do. Okay. And then they usually calm down, right? But that's all from training, right? So things I'm looking for, right? Um, training activities. Again, you can do practical application, right? We can do um, uh, assessments. We can do, you know, lectures. We can do um, um, just videos. There's so many training activities you can do. The key is picking out the right one that makes sense. Okay, I have a question yes. for the training uh, training activity. Mm -hmm. Is it a good strategy to make a colleague train a, another or a new employee? Yes, if, sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. If you know that your colleague is maybe better at something or understands something a little bit more than you do, even if it's, it is fresh, I mean, like a, a fresh employee came to the team and yeah. like. He is gonna train him from A to B. Is it a good like activity or a good strategy or like it must be like in another way? When you say what do you mean by like you have to have someone else train that person? Yeah, like a colleague or, or like it's gonna be better if you like give him a general training, like an instructor or something like that. Oh, uh, I see what you're saying. So well if if you have that right, that's when we're gonna talk about orientation. Mm -hmm. So orientation. Is basically where a new employee get their training, right? But the training is, is normally about just uh, about the company. Um, yeah, you know, or something, right? right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's going on? So more technical, more specific things. Yeah, you should be trained by a new colleague, right? You're not going to get the training from an outside. We're not going to bring somebody in mm -hmm. about hey, you know, you're new, so let me train you and pay. No, you know, hey. No, you pay, you train them. Okay, it works for you. You're gonna be doing the same job or something you did or you know about. Train them up. All okay? right, get them, get them, get them spun up. Okay, he has the foundation. Right, we want to hire him. He did not have the foundation, yeah, yeah. but the colleague, someone will train him that's within that department or within the company at the very least. All right, he's gonna be trained. It's very rare that you have um, external training. Um, our sort of training for new folks, right? Not that it doesn't make sense, but unless it's something where the company outsources that already, then I may bring that outsource 
resource in to teach training those folks, mm -hmm. right? So if if I, you know, if I'm like if I'm Toyota and I, you know, I'm you know, I manufacture cars, right? But I don't build the engines on site. Somebody else builds the engine. Okay. But I have some new guys who are engine mechanics or who are mechanics in general, and they fix the make they do the maintenance. Okay. Maybe I bring in the outsource guys to come in and train those guys because they're the experts. They know we outsource this anyway. It's not like we do it in house. So if we don't do it in house, we already have the expertise. So if we have the expertise, then it makes sense to bring somebody else out. Or the person can, you know, you can, um, OJT on job training. They can shadow another mechanic. You know, there's, there's a couple of different things. But yeah, nine times out of 10, another colleague will train that person and it makes the most sense because whoever that colleague is is doing the same job or something close to it or the same job, one thing. Secondly, they're there on site with you close by, you know, maybe a couple of desks over and accessible, right? Third, it's free. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, it's free. All right, so I'm like, hey, uh, I'm going to need you to train new guy. All right, yes, take him to lunch too. Anything <laughs> you do, he's going today. All right, or for the next week, or two weeks, yeah. or a month, or whatever I've always been, right? You don't have to take him home, but <laughs> work at the very least, you need to be around, okay? So, um, there's different ways to do that. Okay, but yeah, answer your question, yes. It's more like your colleague. Okay. All right. So when we talk about, you know, training in, in old digital competitive or really what's it gonna give me on the outside or externally, it's about me getting better as a company, right? So I can compete more in the market. Okay, that's really what it boils down to. I wanna make it my competitive advantage. That yeah, I have people that are better trained, better equipped than you do. Right? And they're better equipped and better trained. Guess what I get? I get better results, I get better products, right? I also get people that are challenged and happy. Okay. I also get less lawsuits, less turnover, less absenteeism, a lot of things, right? Training facilitates, you know, the ability to, you know, engage people, right? Get people involved and say, hey, you know what? Not only am I going to, you know, train you, but I'm going to give you some new knowledge, right? I'm going to give you some new information, right? Yes, I'm training you, but there's some other interesting aspects to this training, right? Things you can use in other ways personally, right? And so I'm really trying to push that as, you know, the goals, right? Um, learning culture. I want to make sure that everybody in organization knows that we're about getting better here as a company, right? There's some companies you'll go to and you'll know right away, or oh, they'll tell you like, hey, don't ask to go to no training. We don't have any training. We don't pay for that. We don't do any of that, okay? Other companies, as soon as you walk in the door, hey, what training session do you want? What is it that you want to learn? What, what, I know what you're doing, but what what do you want to be an expert at? Like, what do you really want to know? And they have all these training venues, right? They have all these things that offer you, hey, we're going to pay for you to go to school, go get your master's and your PhD, all, you know, certification that's going to help you with some other stuff, or, you know, maybe it's essential to the job, such as, you know, like, you want to be a stockbroker, you got to take the 7B series and some other tests, but you have to be sponsored by, the, by a company to take that. Bigger test of you know, to be a stockbroker. So the training in that is that I come in as a junior stockbroker, not really just a junior analyst, and I shadow somebody and I sit next to a more experienced stockbroker and I learn the roles. Okay. And then from there I go take my test, right? But you have to take the test in order to become a stockbroker. Okay, right? just like being a doctor, lawyer, I pass the bar. I gotta pass, I gotta get through residency, right? And all this other stuff. Okay. So we want to be, you know, we want to gain new knowledge, right? Or be known as knowledgeable. And we also want to create an environment of learning. Okay, as from an organizational standpoint, right? We want people to know that we know what we're doing, 
and we encourage our folks to learn even more. Right? Even if it has nothing to do with the job sometimes. Okay, we want you to learn more because it adds value to who you are and adds value to the company if you're more well rounded, if you have exposure to different things, exposure to different cultures, right? Exposure to different technology and software. Like, yeah, I don't know how to use it, but I've seen it before. Right? I can I, I'm yeah, I'm pretty sure I, I can understand it. I just need a, I need a short training session, but yeah, I've seen AWS before, I've seen Microsoft Azure before, I've seen Databricks. I know what cloud computing is or edge computing is. I know what machine learning is. I know what, you know, I know how chat GPT kind of works, right? All these things, you know, Dolly and, and, and Wally and all these other AI things, right? You, you learn them, right? But you may not say use them when you did a job, right? But they also enhance you as a person, and that means you bring more things because I have different perspective about it, all right? So, Knowledge management and also learning culture. All right, two things. All right, so, all right. so when we talk about HR and some of the, the legal issues and training, okay? So, not because training isn't always mandatory, um, most people, I would say 70% of the workforce, they don't care. They're not going to lose anything. They don't want to. They don't want to learn anything new. So it's not something they're interested. You have a question? No. Okay. Um, they're not interested. They don't care. Right? The other 30 percent, they want to learn something. They're trying to figure it out. Like, okay, what else can I get? What else? What else can you give me, company? What else can I learn? Okay. And they want to learn. Then there's other situations where. We only have a certain amount of spots for this particular training because it's so expensive, it's so specific, right? But who do we send? Which is an important kind of uh, area because you don't want to get caught in sending someone because of anything other than one, they're the best qualified, right? Two, timing is good, right? Three, uh, I can afford to, you know, let them go for a certain period of time. Okay, you don't want it to be where it's favoritism, right? Or some kind of nepotism that we talked about last week, cronyism, and all. You got to get to on that one, on that Ellie. Okay, so when you're talking about doing favors and you know bringing people on through family connections and that kind of thing, we don't want that. We want a fair and random, not well. Not random, but we want a fair and objective selection of where we're, we're going to go to the training. Okay. Because if there's only five spots for the training, say for instance, right? There's a special program. There's only five spots for the training. I have to pick the right five people, right? Because once you get into this program, right? And if you look at it from a, a standpoint of as a student or as somebody who's trying to move up the ladder, right? You know, everyone that's going through that training. Guess what? They get promoted to vice president. Don't only select people that they think can be vice presidents. Of course, I want to go to that training. Why would I not want to go to the training? All right? But I don't get picked. Why not get picked? All right? And that becomes a problem. Because now it seems like, okay, you, you are creating a barrier for me to get to the next level. Because this training is my medium is my portal to the next level exactly right and so if only four or five people get picked a year for this particular training you have to be really careful on how you select them it has to be merit based can be based on oh you know just we, we need to you know have more women in this particular level or we need to have more minorities in this level right or we need this 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 it has to be hey who's the best qualified who's going to has the most potential to be successful in the program. Because it don't always funny sending someone to training that we know they will often fail just to meet a quota, just to meet a check in the box. Okay? So you don't want to, because you can get sued for that. Right? An individual can sue you because they feel that you discriminated against them and didn't give them an opportunity to this next level and then get into the training and they were qualified, more qualified or, you know, just as qualified as the people that got into it, there's going to be problems, okay? 
And we see this in not, well, we still see it now, but we really saw it back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, 70s, even in the 80s, right? We still have it in our country. Yeah, we still have it in our country, right? Yeah. It's, it's, this is tough, but here in the United States, we went through a transition, especially with women, in trying to get into them into different fields, or them women into different fields. There's a particular, um, you know, story about uh, NASA, right? Anybody from NASA, the moon, astronauts, all that good stuff, right? There was a core of women who were pilots that wanted to become astronauts. And so they went through all the training that the men went through because, of course, back then, it was considered women were too weak, they were too emotional, they're not good pilots, they, they can't be as good as the guys, they physically, they can't do it, they're just too demanding, whatever it is. Well, this group of women. Yeah, okay. I don't know. He's all right. I know a story. Of you know a story? Yeah. yeah. They went through the training. Mm -hmm. They did better than the men. Yeah. Physically, mentally, emotionally, they killed, killed the men. Mm -hmm. They came destroy them. But they, were, they wouldn't publish that. Okay? They wouldn't publish that. So it turned into this big lawsuit. Okay? Because the women, if they had done better than the men, they would be put into the astronaut program, and then eventually they would get to go on one of the moon missions. Right, but they never they never got a chance. They got pushed to the side, and then uh, John Glenn and Buzz Aldrin and that and some other guys went to the moon first instead of the women going, even though they were better qualified. Okay, so it came to a lawsuit, Congress, all the Supreme Court, and some stuff, right? And so eventually, you know, now we have female astronauts, and we have females in pretty much every everywhere, everywhere right? Um, but huh? Not, but not in the class. Not in the class. No, no females in the class. <laughs> All the, ladies, all the ladies decided to go on um, on on the moon today, which is okay. That's all right. Yeah, we, we we're gonna survive, okay? We know the ladies keep a good balance here, keep everybody in check. But uh, we're, we're gonna behave, okay? Um, so you know that there, there's always been that fight for equality, for you know access to certain things that's gonna get you to the next level, and that's one of them. Right into the program and make sure you select the right person, right, and for the right reason. Okay. All right. Um, when you look at it, considering only job related factors, as I said before, right? Only looking at things that you know what merits or what skills you have that are job related that you're gonna bring to the table or that the training's gonna provide you. Okay. And then if you fit that criteria, then cool, we'll, we'll you know we'll select you. Okay. Again. HR does not control or have say so in who goes into training. Direct leader. That's right. If the supervisor, direct leader, that's where it stops. If your boss says no, you don't go to training, you never you're not gonna do the training. Right? Unless you do it on your off time. All right. If your boss is gonna open the training and can let you go, that kind of thing, then cool. But most times bosses, what are they concerned about? What what is a is a manager always worried about? Rhythm. Well, that rhythm results, right? It's like that person breaks for training. No, that's what well, they consider that. But why? Why is it that managers may say, "I can't let you go to training"? And, and it's, yeah, it's, it's actually the result of the target. <laughs> yeah. So if you if you don't have some days for training, it's yeah. probably going to be a short time. Right. It's going to be short. Who's going to have to do the work? The manager, right? So wait a minute. So you're gonna to go to training and I'm gonna do your work? Yeah, I don't like that. And then yeah, maybe this training thing is not such a good idea. We're gonna let you slide. Well, but I'm gonna to go to training though. Yeah. Right? Because I want to move up. Okay. And this is typically that the problem that happens is that the managers don't necessarily want uh the employees to go to training because then they have to do work, which they probably haven't done in a long time, right? They're not familiar with it. It, it, that's the truth, right? But the more you move up, the more detached you are from what is really going on, right? The basics, yes. exactly, right? You know, you're so far removed from the basics, mm -hmm. right? It's not that you didn't know when you did them before, it's that that's not what you do now, right? And so you get rusty, they're perishable skills. So, you know, you can't, like, I, I don't use report anymore. I don't know how to do this. I have no idea what this does anymore. I know what it is and its function, but the intricacies and 
Like the minutia? I don't know. I have no idea. So I need to say. This happened with me like last week. So I was, mm. my dad is an account, chartered accountant in India. Mm. So I was asking him, like, can you help me to find out this, uh, like, TV and that, all this? And he mm. said, like, yeah, I remember all this thing, but I have to open my book again. Yeah. <laughs> all the time. Yeah, I do it all the time. When I see my statistics class, I have to go back. Refresh my memory about some things because I don't necessarily remember all the terms, all the stuff, and what it's meaning. Because I don't use it all the time, right? But you know, the foundation is there. But then I'm like, I got to teach the class. There's there's a lot of things I need to hit, and I don't remember what I'm supposed to do. So I go back to my book, right? But if I had somebody who was teaching the class and I was managing them, right? I'd be like, okay, good luck. Teach the class. What you gotta do? Just make sure you let me know what's going on, right? And they say, why not take a week off? For what <laughs> training? Wait, did I teach the class? Like, I don't know about that. Okay, so I'm okay with it, but not everybody is. All right, so job related factors, training contract, um, compensation for training outside of work hours. So, when you are in training, you it's considered your work day. Okay, so you have to get paid for that. Yes. Now, the training could be on site if it's on site. And it's cool, right? If it's off site, that's where the money comes in, right? And even on site, I still have money that I pay out, right? Because when the training's on site, so if I'm doing on site training, what are some of the things that I'm going to think about if I'm putting the training together, if I'm coordinating the training, right? What are some things that you would think about as far as the training coordinator? On site. Yeah, on site. Like, you know, we're at a building, you know, my, our building we work at, and then the training is going to be in the building. Like in any like conference room or something? Right, yeah. Yeah. So, what are some of the things I would think about as a training coordinator if the training is going to be on Bring food. What's that? Bring food. Bring the food, yeah. right? You think it's some minor, but I'm glad you brought it up first. The food. You know, like, okay. So, most times, nine times out of ten, the company provides food. For the the training, something which makes people to really attend and like. Well, they're gonna come anyway because so, most time it's mandatory training, right? Mm -hmm. So it's two it's two things. It's either if it's mandatory, you're gonna show up anyway. You have to, right? And if it's elective, and you chose to come, you're gonna come because you want to come, right? So you're gonna be there, right? But the company itself understands like, hey, we're having the training. We can provide food. Even more, like drink. Have to be drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They need to find something, right? Look, we look, this is we have some a resume training, a work resume workshop class before yeah. you guys came in. That cookie, that yeah. cookie yeah. Right? Yeah. Training, we provide some food, right? Mm -hmm. Not much cookies, some water, some you know, snacks, whatever the case may be. But it's important because now we have to look at what time do I start the training? Okay. Now, if I start the training early in the morning, first thing, no. right? It depends. It depends what kind of training I'm doing and how long it's going to take, right? So if I say you might just start the training in the morning, guess what I need to have? I need to have some kind of breakfast ready to go by. Okay. I have to take into consideration that some people have to drop their kids off before they come to work, right? So I can't start a tour. I have to kind of keep it within the normal time frame. All right, so I have to consider about that. I have to consider about accessibility when it comes to training. The problem with on site training is that it's on site. So I'll be sitting there, I'll be training and talking, and then I'll see somebody come to the door and they'll open the door. Say, oh, excuse me, hey, um, Dr. Cage, I got a thing. I need, I need such and such. Like, okay. Like, Thank you, man. You know, I need training, man. I need teaching. And then they go, and I'll see them for hours. <laughs> they come back. What, what, what did I miss? What did I miss? You missed a lot, but you know what happened. I don't know. Work emergency email came, and they came and got me because nobody had the answer, and, uh, and nobody could figure it out. I figured it out, even though they could have figured it out. They just didn't want to, right? Because I was downstairs. They came and got me. It's easier for me to put them to come get me and try to figure out themselves, right? So with the on-site training, you have issues because 
people are so accessible, right? People get bothered, right? They go up to even during lunch. They may, we may have lunch here, but they'll take their lunch and they'll go straight back to their desk, check the email, you know, yeah. sit there, do a work, and then they get caught up in their work. And next thing you know, oh, shit, it's two o'clock. I'm going to be back at one. All right? The boss is like, hey, you coming down at a meeting? Not in training. Oh, just, just come in for 10 minutes. Just come in for 10 minutes. Okay? So having on-site training, it, it, it's good, but it's not good. All right? It's pros and cons. All right? Uh, but it does save money, but you also have to keep in mind that there is a little bit of money that, that goes into food and that kind of thing. Offside training though is the story. Okay. Offside training is a little bit more expensive, right? But what you get is total commitment, total obligation, right? Because now there's nothing, I'm not worried about somebody from work coming down and saying, hey, I need you. Worst case scenario, they can email you or they can text you or call you, right? But for the most part, I normally just say, hey, put your phone on silent. If it's an emergency, great. Then go out and take a phone call. But if it's not an emergency, then you should leave the, the, the student alone. Let them focus on the training at hand because that's what you're paying me for. What you're paying them for to come to training. If you call them every two seconds, you're distracting them. Okay? Your wife's calling, your kids are calling, everybody's calling, your grandma's calling. Call them. Mom's calling. Everybody's calling. Like they know you're training, right? When they when you're at work, nobody calls you. When you're in training, they don't call you. Everybody. Everyone calls you because everybody all of a sudden they got a problem when you're training. <laughs> okay, it only happens in training. It doesn't happen any other time, right? Um, so you got to compensate for training outside of work hours. Um, if as as long as it's within work hours, but you just continue your job for that moment, you're good to go. Um, and you don't want it to go past the work hours. You know, that's really what they're, they're trying to get at. Don't want it, if, if you get off at five, normally at work, then you want to try to keep the training between nine and five during work hours. You don't want to disrupt the person's schedule too much. Um, but if it's off site, it's no different, right? Because let's say, you know, you get to your job and you have some training in Vegas. Right? There's a lot of training that goes on in Vegas, actually. A lot of conventions, a lot of seminars, and that kind of thing. Uh, and so, like, hey, you know what? We're going to start at 10, okay, in Vegas, maybe 11, and we'll go to 6 or 7, okay? Is that okay with everybody? Yeah, because we know as soon as you guys get out of class, everybody's running the party, okay? They're going to some restaurant, club, bar in Vegas. You got in, yeah. you got no choice. You got to go, right? You got to get your friend, everybody in the class. Hey, the whole class is going here. We're going to have a good time. We're out to two o'clock in the morning. Whew. Okay, yes, 10, 11 sounds good. Yeah. All right. So you have to keep those things in mind. All right. You have to keep things in mind as far as like, hey, we don't want any incidents outside, you know, when you go to Vegas and that kind of thing. Or normally, if it's all off site training, um, they try to keep it so it's super boring. You know, they, try, they don't try to make it too exciting. You know, because they don't want you going out and partying too hard, right? Vegas, though, you know, it is what it is, right? Um, OSHA, training requirements, and the email on, right? So all these things that we kind of have to adhere to, uh, Occupational Safety, uh, Health Administration, OSHA, right? You might know with OSHA. OSHA basically makes sure everything is good to go as far as, like, you know, the structures, facilities, you know, um, fire signatures, fire codes, all this stuff that goes on in a building, you know, hazards, all that stuff, that's all OSHA, all right? Fall plans, all right? everybody's doing fall plans. So if you're working on a construction site or a pipe, there's a fall plan. So basically the fall plan is kind of like the, how the uh, procedure on how to, you know, go up, go down. Out of harness, three points of contact, that kind of thing. Lag, uh, tag out, key out, uh, tag out, lag out. Tag out, lag out, right? If you're working on electrical or anything like that, you gotta tag it, lock it out, right? Let everybody, so everybody can see, okay, this is locked in, being worked on, don't mess with it, all right? Don't turn it on, somebody's going to end up dead, all right? Those kind of things, right? So OSHA manages all that. And then EEO, of course, they have our laws that we have to adhere to. What time is it? Okay. Just one question. So yes. basically, like, um, so human resources, the 
like a term, like people like which arrange the training, not like do the training. Right? No, we're not doing training. So the only training you do is the onboarding. HR yeah. does the onboarding, okay. and even then, if you are in the all of it, so they just arranged like the place and like all of the resources. Mm -hmm. Very fit the, I would say they fit the venue. They they coordinate for the payment of the venue. They make sure that the whoever's putting it on has the money to buy food, whatever. They track all the bills or receipts and that kind of thing. So they have to go to building or county. Um, they make sure that everything's recorded in each person's uh, employee record, you know, to make sure that we that we have it that you took this training, that kind of thing. Any certificates that have to go out or be annotated on your personnel record, those kind of things, right? And we just make sure that we manage the training. Okay, we did this training year one in 2022. We're not going to be training again for another two years. That's HR's job. Okay. Then you kind of manage that. But everything else, we don't. Hey, that's that's on the person that put the training on. Right? Who, who selects the trainer? Normally, the people that have been putting training on. The like, hiring manager. So the, whatever department who wants um, to like if their managers like suppose like executives want like my employee needs to be trained so they they decide the trainer. Yeah, so it's it's one of two things. Um one we have on an, an authorized vetted vendor list. Right. And so we have these people that are authorized vendors that we've already looked at, examined, maybe they've done you know uh training for us before. Or other companies that are very reputable. Okay, we have them on this list, right? And then like, okay, IT training. We have four or five vendors that are authorized. Say, hey, pick one of these guys. If it's something that is a company that's not authorized yet, right? Or if it's somebody that you know you kind of like, I don't really have anything. And you go out and you get them. That's up to the hiring manager or the, the manager, the supervisor, to say, hey, I want. To train on this, do we have this in house? If we don't have it in house. Do we have an authorized vendor list? If we don't have an authorized vendor list, I want to get this person or this company to do the training for us. And then they're like, okay, well, go through the vetting process, right? And the vetting process normally goes to contracting, right? And then contracting will look it over and they'll vet the company. It's not really up to the hiring manager or HR, it's really contracting that will go. Do all the background check, make sure the company's reputable, better business, do all that good stuff. Uh, look at you know their track record, and then come back and say, okay, good to go. We can use this company, and then boom, whatever that is, coordinates uh, through contracting, coordinates to HR. Says, hey, you want to use this company? HR contracting will reach out to that company and say, hey, you know we want you to be training for our company specifically here, um, and then get all the details. They coordinate all that between contracting. And um, in the company, uh, and HR will be involved. So will accounting, um, and so will the you know the department that's being affected, the supervisor of that department, right? You know, they all coming together and do all that stuff, right? But you know, when it comes down to you know trying to figure out who who's doing the training, you know, it really is up to the the expert, the center expert, right? But the supervisor to figure out what's the best who's who do you think is the best instructor for the training, right? Because many times they'll have managers or you know people internally that will say, "I can do training," you know, "I can do it," and they'll do it, right? Usually, if we outsource it, then we don't have anybody in house to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the initiative basically comes from the management side. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Not from the human. Not 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 for um. Not for skills or technical mm -hmm. stuff, right? More uh, mandatory training, EEO, sexual harassment, mm -hmm. you know, uh, workplace environment, all the HR stuff we talk about here, mm -hmm. that's mandated. HR manages all that. HR will say, hey, we're having a sexual training here. Somebody have a question on Zoom? No. Okay. Um, yeah, HR manages that. But everything else is really about the the supervisor. Yeah, I was I was saying that you know, um, the HR was not known the position that the supervisor 
to know who needs to learn Python, who needs to know more about the R programming or something, and so on and so on, that is not very good position and C, C or something like that. So we have to raise it to be in general. I need these guys to go for this role. Mm -hmm. All right, I have people now that can go, but I, have, I don't have. Mm -hmm. So you'll be you in best position to advise me. Yeah. Yeah. HR in, in, in general is just a manager. The department itself is just a manager of things. HR very rarely is the decision maker or um, the final step in, in anything as far as bringing the people on and authorizing certain things. HR doesn't really have any authority to do anything, right? We just manage stuff. And so, as Kenya said, we don't, you know, it's up to the department manager, the department head to know exactly what the deficiencies are or the areas they want to train in, right? Aside from the mandatory things that uh, the law dictates, HR is like, I don't know what you want to train on, right? But HR will also have a repository of all the training that is available within the organization, right? They will manage that and they will send out every probably year or two years, hey, update your training list, okay? And they'll send out to each department and the requisite uh, or the appropriate training venues and say, hey, all right, these are the trainings that you said you you know you wanted for your guys five years ago. Update this. Is this still relevant? And then they'll send it back to HR and say, okay, yes, we don't need this one. This one's stupid. We added two more. Okay, good to go. And then HR just holds it, just maintains it. So that when they do come in and say, hey, we need to train somebody, like, oh, is it under one of the training things that you said that you need it for people that work in the department. Oh yeah, here it is. Okay, so you're gonna what you want to train them under, you know, uh, IT computer skills, and underneath that there's classes. You know, there's training. Okay, cool, no problem. Well, no, we don't care. But this is where you want to train them at. Okay, that we can catalog it and, and archive it and keep track of it, right? Because then we start to, you know, when it comes down to um, the VP of HR, like the strategic HR, right? Then I can start looking, okay, and say, how much training did we do in computer and IT stuff last year? And HR better have the answer. Okay. okay. And then say, okay, we did, we had 50 people trained. We had a potential of 100 people trained, but only 50 got trained. We staggered it. We're going to get the other 50 people trained within the next two years. And uh, this contributed to an increase in Excel, PowerPoint, the Microsoft Suite, and Python expertise. Okay, good to go. All right, what's that attached to uh, as the organizational goal? Well, that's attached to the fact that we're going to start doing, um, you know, cloud computing. We're going to start doing doing data wrangling, right? We're going to start building uh, uh, pipelines of, or some kind of platform uh, to help, you know, whatever company do whatever. Okay, cool. They can kind of attach it so they kind of see the strategic outlook. So, okay, where do I need to put more money at? All right. Because some of the training, but like, well, okay, did marketing do any training? Like, yeah, they did some training. Okay, good to go. Like, how much training did they do? They did a million dollars worth of training. A million dollars? What is, what is marketing doing exactly? Why do they need a million dollars worth of training? All right, let me let's pull it up. Let's see what it is. Okay, let's see. Um, publisher, um, 10 guys went to Dubai for marketing in Dubai? What does that mean? <laughs> All right. Like you gotta answer some tough questions, all right? Like, okay, I need to know what the what is marketing in Dubai mean? What did you learn? Marketing in Dubai, right? Okay, so now we just wasted a million dollars. Good to go. Don't worry about marketing. You're not getting training for the next five years. So your budget, your training budget is now five thousand dollars. Okay, everything will be online and good luck. All right. And because the CEOs want to see how things are are correlated because that's how they make their decisions right where am i going what do i need to get there right i need my human resource my human capital but i need my human capital to have certain skills okay and i need to figure out what's relevant what's not relevant for my vision okay if i no longer let's just say for instance well i just said before chat gpt right anybody is familiar with chat GPT? No? Okay. Anybody familiar with chat GPT on? No? Okay. So chat GPT is this new AI chat box. Okay. Now, 
I built chatbots before. Um, mine suck, but it was just for class, whatever. Okay, but I built them before. And chat boxes are pretty like remedial. They're pretty like they're okay, they're not great, right? You'll see your chat box, like sometimes you'll be in your computer and they say hey, you want to chat, right? You think you're chatting with a real person, but you're not. Computer. Okay, it's AI. Most times, it's AI. Sometimes you'll say, hey, wait a minute, let me get a representative for you. And then that's a real person. Okay, but nine times out of ten nowadays, it's an algorithm. Okay, but it's 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 pretty sophisticated in the sense that it has an understanding of what you're saying and, and, and all that, right? But there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes of that. Okay, and so the chat the chat GPT basically is like probably the most sophisticated chat box that's ever been built so thus far. Okay, it can write papers for you. It can it the chat box just passed the uh, the GRE test or the test that's required to get into uh, the Wharton School of Business. The chat GBT just passed it algorithm. with the highest score anybody's ever got. It's an algorithm that just passed one of the hardest tests there is to pass to get into Penn State. Okay, the business school. So what I'm saying is that that technology right there, if I see that as a CEO, right, and I say, okay, we're not training in that, but if I do train my people in that, what does that, what kind of power does that give? What kind of leverage does that give? It gives me the ability to fire the 10 people that are doing the same job that the chat you can keep in here, okay? This is why important I need to know what kind of training I'm doing. Because if we're training over here for programming, and the stuff that you're programming is like no longer relevant, right? We need to chuck that training, first thing. Secondly, I need to get my people retrained in something that's more relevant, right? I need to figure out how to spend my money because I need you to be, um, you know, innovative and relevant because the, the things that I want to do, we're going to need to enhance our skill set. Okay? So from a strategic level, when the CEO or the C-suite looks at training, they're really trying to figure out how to connect to my long-term objectives. Not my current objectives, my long-term objectives, right? Because that's what the CEO is looking for. The CEO is about vision, right? The CEO is about today. CEO, operations, day-to-day, -day, that's what I'm worried about. CEO, I'm all about vision, 15, 30, 50, 100 years down the road, where do I want to be as a company? Right? I still want to be around, right? What is that going to take, right? Let me see what we're training our people then. What skill sets are resident within my organization that I can monetize, right? Oh, we have somebody that does this. Cool. I can offer it as a service now, right? Cost $100,000. No problem, okay? Because you're one of one or there's a few you know, within the community, and I have one, and guess what? I'm going to be going to train, and guess what? We're going to send more people to get trained because this is the way things are going, right? This is the way the trend of society, right? This is the way kind of, you see how um, esports, anybody from the esports, mm -hmm. right? How esports has is blown up and just now you go to, it's a, it's a major in college. You go to college for gaming. That's crazy. That's crazy. Okay? That doesn't make any sense to me. You you go to college for what? Gaming? So you go get a degree in video games? How to play video games? Not even how to make them, just how to play them. Yeah. For real? Yeah. yeah. In India, they made yeah. like a university there. Yeah, it's so like it's like a not big, but like a it's very focused to like all the games and yeah. all the understanding and everything. That's it. It's like a two years course there. Yeah. <laughs> wow, but you're good. You're gonna make money. Yeah, you're good. You're gonna make lots of money because yeah, yeah. 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 there were these competitions yeah. and all these stuff. Yeah. Branded like the million million dollars like prize board. Yeah. There's a kid when he was 16, like three years ago. He won a million dollars. So he, uh, I think it was. Um, no. Huh? No, no. no. Yeah, no, no, yeah, I think it was, yeah, 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 yeah. No, but one PUBG also, I don't know. 
Yeah, so all these they're playing these games, they're making millions of dollars, 16 year old playing games. So you have all these, you know, big schools, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, all you know, all these schools, they have these gaming programs now. Yeah. You get a four-year degree in gaming. Okay. Yeah. Now, there's other things behind it. You know, it's just not about games. You know, it's about development and yeah. you know, strategy, psychology. It's you know, esports. It's still a sport, I guess, um, in some aspect. <laughs> you know, it just it, it adds different things, right? You have to, it's a different type of sport. It's more mental agility, cognitive skills, dexterity. You know, it, it's some of the athletic stuff, but mostly. On the mind, on the mind, right? So it's not it's not that it's bad, and it's been around forever. We just never saw it as a as as something we can monetize, right? Nobody ever saw gaming as being such a big you thing, make money from it. right? All right. Nobody. I remember when you know when I was growing up, we had an Atari. I don't know if you guys even know what Atari is. Yeah. You guys remember yeah. Atari? I had it. Oh no, you probably didn't have Atari. I had it. I had it. You had old, you had yeah. old Atari with just one joystick, yeah, mm -hmm. and the old wood and just yeah. one cartridge, and you put it in and you put this what? Yeah, yeah. okay, all right, we're old and like our country is not like uh, more technology like oh, the, you got the old stuff, right? The old, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm only had Atari, Atari. Like, and I was like, man, this thing is great. My mother did not like me playing Atari. She liked like me playing video games, like read a book, go outside, do something else, right? Go to church, go to church, yeah, go to church. <laughs> Me, Jesus, <laughs> in your life, Allah, somebody, you can say it, yeah. right? And I'm just like, nah, it's a video game, you know? And she's like, okay, whatever. There's a YouTuber, like, uh, his name is Carrie, uh -huh. right? and uh, when he just plays online, he does streaming, and he has, like, almost, like, 300,000, 400,000 people watching Just watching, yeah. Just watching him. I, the thing is, like, my brother's a gamer, and I'm not, right? But I love watching him play. I don't know why. It's just interesting to me. Just watching him watching the maneuver and just watching his fingers and how quick yeah. he's just processing things and he's already thinking about the next thing he has to do and he's just kind of like okay, I gotta do this. It's, oh, you know, when he doesn't get it, he keeps trying, he keeps trying sometimes till three or four o'clock in the morning, but he keeps trying right to get us over a certain obstacle, right? There's something to be said about the persistence, right? The, the question is, is who makes more money? Your brother. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I make more. Well, I make well. That was tough. That was tough. He's, a, he's an engineer, so oh, he's an okay. engineer. Right? He's he just game. he just gained you know, He just uh, gained some uh, points. Yeah, he just gained some points. My my brother's an engineer. He's, he's the smartest one out of all of us. This real one. He's the smartest one. Okay. Um. Yeah, he's a he's a math guy. Well, math guy, but he's a math math guy. Um. And so you know, there's something to be said, but at the same time. You know, all that is training, right? All that, all that stuff that the, you know, the technology that's out there and companies are looking at it, say, how can I use the technology to start to streamline my own processes? Okay, and this chat GPT, the reason I bring it up is because it does so many things that make basic programming, basic programmers obsolete, copywriters obsolete. People that just do basic writing, even photographers or um, designers that you know create uh, album covers, right? Or graphic designers, it's it's gonna put them out of business. It's already been that already. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, my colleague, my former colleague, sent me a message yesterday that uh, there's a new AI. So all you need to do is just to type the word. That's it. The uh, chat GPT. Flyer, yeah, and red flyer. Just type it there. Yeah. And it brings out several red flowers for you. So you don't, so you don't have to design for me. No, yeah. Okay. yeah. There's Chat GPT and there's this thing called Dolly. You probably using Dolly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> One of the two, right? The Chat GPT will even write write a code for you. It will design a website for you. Say, yeah, hey, but, I need a website. The website needs to be focused on this, and it has to have this. And it'll design, it'll, it'll write the code for it. From last so many years, there's a website called Wix has mm -hmm. dropped like so many engineers like this one because it's a platform for free. Yeah. And you can just create your own website. No, website. Yeah. You can yeah. register domain everything. Yeah. And you're good. Yes, yeah. I, I created my website. Wix? Yeah. 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 It's, it's been around, it's been around for a long time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But chat GPT is still totally different, but either way, uh, we'll continue on. How okay. long does it take to build the chatbot? 
A chat a chat yeah. yeah, it, it depends on how complicated you want it to be. How how well yeah, versed yeah. you want it to be. All right. Yeah. So the what? Yeah, like it's easy to, to get uh, yeah, you could probably yeah, yeah, I mean couple hours. Oh, that's it. Just build a chat one on yeah. Oh, two okay. hours maybe. That's and that's because I'm rusty with my car time. Mm. I yeah, I'm just I'm just like eight years. No, <laughs> no, not, not for a basic chat box, not for something that oh, says, yeah, yeah. What's your name? and then you put your name in. What do you do? Mm. What can I help you with? No, that's, that's basic, two hours, right? Once you start getting to more complicated questions, like, So, I like to eat this. How do you think I should, you know, go about making such, such and such? My chat box won't do that. My chat box won't be able to answer you because what goes behind the chat box is something we call natural language. The natural language is, is super complicated because um, it kind of breaks down the English language. But the problem with the chat box is, is that it's hard to account for the nuance in speaking. We all speak differently. Your accent throws the chat box off. Right. Mm -hmm. like, um, yeah, Alexa, yeah. It, it throws, it's Alexa. Alexa is a, a complicated chat box. We, Alexa is what we call Internet of Things. Yeah. All right. It's a, it's a piece of equipment that's attached to a database and it just pulls information. You, you know, uh, it pulls information from a, a certain source and then it feeds it back to you, right? It's a push pull type. Um, uh, piece of equipment, but Alexa has is has access to millions and millions of pieces of data. Okay, and the way it puts it together, right? The semantics, the way it puts it together, it it has what we call a corpus. Okay, and so you need a corpus to create a chat box, and all the corpus is is it's a collection of words that are related to each other that the algorithm can now start to piece together and say, okay, this word is here, the next word more likely is going to be this. Mm -hmm. where, where, where do you see that at? What, what, what function do you when see that you at? Start. When you text, yeah, when I right? When, I start. when you text, right? The, and then it says, the, the. Next, yeah, next, next, right? Yeah. That is coming from a corpus. But that corpus is extremely large, mm. extremely large. But that takes that took years to build. Mm. Okay, and every day it's updated. Every day new things go into it. Right, you, you, build, you build up the lexicon, and that's why it's, it's difficult for um, chat boxes because chat boxes have a hard time identifying emotion. You can't identify. You can't identify somebody's mad. Unless maybe they put all that thing in capital letters, right? Then we know that that's someone screaming, all right? Yeah. Chat boxes will know that unless we put in that particular function or that line of code that says if all caps, then emotion equals angry. And what does angry equal, right? And those are the things that you kind of have to code. It's hard coding emotion, believe me. No, yeah, no. It's difficult. Okay. Is that doable though? Huh? Is that doable though? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Every everything's numbers in 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 when you're building algorithms. When you're building when you're writing code, it's about being able to take that that word and or that emotion or that thing. And how do I make it numerical so the computer understands? Everything zeros and ones. Mm. All right. How do I change that that data that text? Into numbers so that it can uh, understand. understand it. Okay. All right. Let's take uh ten minutes. What time is it? Almost seven. seven. Almost seven. Whoa. Yeah. Let's take ten minutes and come on back. Come back at seven to ten. Is it exactly? Ten? No. It's, it's yeah. Come back at seven ten. Oh, well, thank you, professor. Thank you. No problem. Bye, Afghan. How are you doing, professor? Good. I'm good. I really I'm miss good. you. Good. You good? Professor, I'm trying to learn probably it's too difficult. <laughs> you, you're doing good. You're doing good, okay? I, yeah, I... You're doing good. I like BI, really. I think it's like maybe it's had a good future for me, BI. Yeah. Wait. AI is good. AI is fun. Yeah, now I, I'm in the middle of that. Okay, good. Are you? 
Yeah, Power BI. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Laura, how are you doing? I'm good so far. Good so far? Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Uh, now that's in general. How are you doing in general? Not the quiet, not tonight, just in general. Yeah, I'm good. I'm trying to be good as much as I can. <laughs> okay. All right, good. Okay. Thank you. No Thank problem. you so much for your support. Thank you. No worries. Uh, let's see. Santico, are you good? Okay, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, maybe. <laughs> All right, I'm just checking everybody, making sure everybody's good. Uh, Christina, how you doing? You uh you you got a you got a little help a little problem at the house, huh? Yeah, we're doing good though. Okay. We're hanging. You look asymptomatic to me. <laughs> huh? Asymptomatic to me. You look like you look fine. Uh, no? Oh no. no. All right, well. Hey, I do have a question. Um, can you tell um, explain a little bit about um, the project that's due at the end of the week? The case study? Yeah, like I haven't um, been in touch with my group. I'm, I'm uh, in contact with them through WhatsApp, but nothing's kind of been delegated. Nobody has kind of taken over. So I'm kind of uh, confused what to do. Okay, well, <laughs> send me an email, CC me okay. on it. And then if you don't get any traction from there, then I'm going to put you on autopilot. Okay. Okay. But they, should, they need to pony up. Yeah. Okay. Send them an email. Nothing complicated. Just like, hey, I'm trying to reach you guys and get this thing going. And if I don't see any traction on it, if you tell me nobody responded back to you, just make sure you see. I will for sure. Well, it says I'm in group three. Um, where do I find the other members? That is a good question, which I meant to ask Marcelo. Um, but what I'll do is I would send you, send me an email, just like I do. You send me the members of group three, and I'll send it to you tonight. Okay. I can do that. Okay. Mm, let's see. No free. We're good. Well, I'll keep that around. Yeah, you. Yeah, you. Yeah, you. Don't be on a scene earlier. Yeah.
a good thing in, in sort of a way because then companies aren't looking for it they mostly going off your experience yeah. right and what you've done it, it just depends really on the industry and or your operation manager for this or you can get an operation manager here operation manager at a hospital is different than an operation guy at an you know, actual manufacturing plant you know so there's different things you got to be versed in right if you might be operation operation manager at a manufacturing car manufacturing plant right you have to understand assembly lines you have to understand material you have to understand you know hazmat to a high level you have to understand machinery you have to understand you know some chemistry some physics right you gotta you know kind of know a little bit of what same thing with construction manager you gotta know design you gotta understand architecture you gotta understand you know um basic electricity foundation you know, you, there's a lot, you know, those things you can get certified in so many other areas um, within operations. HR, you know, once you get your sure certification, you know, you kind of like, okay, and that will help you move up if you get your insurance, you know, your, then your regular insurance is your uh, professional. Yes, as of this term, yeah, yeah. So you get the highest one, it'll definitely help you. Um, and the job, you know, you start getting into one, one, you know, hundred thousand dollars into the six figures, but it takes a little bit, right? But you can, you can, you can go take the exam, but you have to have a certain amount of experience before you go and take the exam. Yeah, you can't have four to five that. years or something like that before you can really sit for the exam. That's an issue. Yeah. yeah. So that's another know, thing. I think I just set up for. Yeah, quality control is pretty good. And thinking about quality control is that you know it it, it aligns with your level of data because that's all it is. Quality control is about data statistics. You know, making sure things stay within a certain parameter, right? Being able to identify ranges, defect rates. You know, and, and, and then it, it kind of ties in. Some of the AI and the SQL stuff, right? I would I would recommend to you if you're starting SQL, take the SQL. Like get it, get it, get it knocked out, like learn it. Because no matter where you go, you're gonna get a job with SQL. Doesn't matter what company, doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what the hell they're looking for. If it's a data analyst, data, you know, a data anything, it could even actual Python, it could actual specific language. You say you have SQL, they're going to do the job. Because SQL is the major, major language for data management, data wrangling, you know, extracting data, analyzing data, cleaning data, normalizing it, standardizing it, getting it ready, because that's really 95% of the work when it comes to programming and just data analysis, is cleaning the data so that we can use it. Right, that's this, this all it is. You spend more time. That's the most important part. That's why data analysts and people who can manipulate data, data manipulation and visualization. That's what SQL does for you, right? Manipulation and visualization. If you can do those things, you have SQL and you have another platform like Tableau or Databricks or anyone, all the length, all the platforms, you can use SQL. AWS, in the Amazon warehouse. Databricks is another, you know, uh, database management platform. Microsoft Azure, all these are the major platforms that are used by the big companies to manage all their data and to manipulate it. They all use SQL. You can program, you can code it, you can program, you can code in Python, SQL, R, and um, I think PHP and Ruby and Rails in all those particular ones. But SQL is one of those things where it could be the only thing on your resume. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So if you can learn SQL, and it's not hard to learn, it just you know, I just have to devote the time. Yeah. SQL is not hard. Um, and Python not hard to learn. Python is about understanding, you know, like any language, understanding the function, the parameters. You got all the libraries you can use, you know, in Python and stuff like that. And, and most everything's already kind of built out there already, right? So you're not, it's not even a build a new. A new convolutional network or a neural network. You're not building neural networks, right? Yeah. You basically cut and paste things, and then you are modifying the, the network or the algorithm for what you want, right? Even if it's computer vision per se, right? You can work in quality control and tech 
your vision or something like that. Right? So there's different aspects to it, but it's not, you know, I I would say, you know, if you're gonna do something, get the SQL knocked out. Because if you go for HR job and it's the SQL, um, they're like, hey, we need you for something else. Yeah, yeah they won't be going to do something else. Cause that, you know, SQL has been around since 16. So, it's, uh, you know, you can't, you really can't get around it. If you have it as a skill set, it's indispensable. And they'll pay you $100,000 by the top, right away. I think you feel better? Good, I'm you feel better, okay? I did my job. <laughs> um, okay. All right, let's get this thing going. All right, so some issues in design and delivery training, right? Okay. Um, let's see. Um, uh, really, let me see. No, again, that's what we do. We get that already. Talk to us for what we get done time. Is that requiring for you to sign training contract? Yeah. yeah. Very rarely you're going to get employed that needs to sign a training contract, right? If they need signing a training contract, more than likely some kind of NDA right? or some, um, uh, not an inclusion or not compete clause. Okay. And so, NDA, non disclosure agreement, means that whatever you get taught in this class and your training, you can't go around talking about it. You can't share it with our competitors. You can't, you can't talk about it. You know, you can talk about it at home in general, but you, know, you can't really go into too much detail, right? We're talking about non compete. We're talking about, hey, if you get this training, that means you're going to commit yourself. To a few more years here, right? And then maybe that's they kind of more that's what they're leaning towards, right? Most training, not most, a lot of training has some time obligation attached to it. So if we train you for six months to a year, that means you're going to give us three years back. Yeah. Okay? Most training, a lot of training is like that, especially with high end training, right? Because they're investing the money in you, they don't want to return, right? And three years is Typically two two years for you normally you know you get one for two sometimes you get one for one but very rarely normally you want one for two one for three okay so that's one part of it the other part of it if you do not compete means that you get the training and let's say for some reason you decide you want to leave right or we fire you or something like that you cannot go out and start your own business in this particular field with this particular Training this particular skill set for next three to four years. Okay, you you can go work with somebody else, but you can't start a business with it. Okay, you can't become a competitor. That's what they don't want, right? Because a lot of the training is very very you know sought after, expensive, and a lot of people they get it and then they, their plan is to always I want to be my own boss, right? I want to open my own business. So they get the training and then boom, they'll take off against the law. If you sign if you sign a non-compete, right? And it's usually in every contract, a non-compete clause. Because I don't want to teach you, right? Then you go off and now you're my competitor, and maybe you have an edge or or something that the reason I hired you because you, you know, maybe you're really good at designing, maybe you have a, a good creative eye, and now I gave you this training, and now you're making these things better than me. You're taking away all my customers, right? But I trained you. So they don't need, that doesn't work well, okay? Doesn't work. Well. Companies don't like that. And they will sue you, shut you down. Okay? Once you sign this over, okay? So that's for that, you know, need to uh, sign contract or something. All right, we talked about the types of training already, legal required, right? Safety compliance, driving skills, whatever, non discrimination, harassment. So this is stuff that we need to have, right? You can see basic remedial skills. English language literacy, core mathematics, right? For the most part, companies don't really offer this anymore because it's kind of like we're expecting you to get that in school and that kind of thing, right? Sometimes they'll give you English language if they know you're coming from a different country, or they give you language training, right? Because we want you to be somewhat versed in the language and be able to navigate and you know function properly. But everything else, you know, um, well, we expect you know how to read, hopefully, okay, you're literate, right? Core mathematics. Usually, they have to deal with the math that is uh, pertaining to that particular job, right? If you're an engineer, I expect you to know differential equations, okay? 
you don't come in here and you don't know the basics of quantum physics or quantum mechanics, okay? If you're an engineer and certain things or certain fields, right? You gotta know what you're doing. Just like if I put it to my accountant, right? If you don't know how to read a balance sheet or income statement or, or you can't, you know, do a little debit and credit, we got problems, okay? We have serious problems, okay? So I expect all that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm all right, so you know, these are all kind of some other types of training that, that go on within the company, right? Um, again, these are more related to jobs that people are doing, that kind of thing. And these are more that jobs that, in general, right, the soft skills that you'll find that a trouble hold, right? Because some of this is mandatory, right? Diversity and inclusion conflict management and resolution, ethics and team relationships. Those are kind of mandatory in some aspects required by the company or required by law, right? And so you'll have those trainings they use and we'll offer that, all right? So you kind of just an area, right? All right, orientation, okay? I'm not gonna delve too much into orientation because I'm sure we've all been to an orientation of some sort, right? New student orientation. Did you guys do new student orientation? Okay, HR function, right? Uh, put on by HR to make sure you understood what the school was about, where to go to the bathroom, who's who in the zoo, right? Who's the CEO? Who's the president? You know, how big is the campus? Where is the campus located? How many classrooms do we have? How many students do we have? What resources are available to me, right? Um, how does the grading system go? And all this stuff, right? You know, all that stuff is orientation, okay? That's the same thing for workplace. You get orientated to the environment, right? It's simple as just, hey, where do I go if I need paper, supplies? Oh, you go here, okay? What if I have some this problem here? You go here. What if something happens here? Who do I call, right? That kind of thing. So orientation is a big deal. And most, I think it's that, but I can't remember the top of my head, but it's more likely you'll be successful in the company if you go through orientation than if you don't. Okay, they've done try, they've done some research and find that people that go to orientation and get an opportunity to, to talk to HR and get you know somebody helps them along and helps them integrate into the, the culture, into the organization, they tend to last longer at the company, they tend to be happier, right? Because they've established some new people, they've established some new networks, some new connections that they can use. They never have a question, right? But it's not going to orientation or not, or not having one then sort of you're kind of in the dark, right? Because if I have a problem, who do I call? They didn't, nobody told me. I don't know who I, who I talked to. I, I, don't, I don't know. They gave me an employee handbook and told me to come back tomorrow, come back the next week to my desk. But I have a problem. Like I got a, somebody died in my family. I got a flat tire, I'm gonna be late for work. Do I call my boss? Who do I call? You know, what happened? What's going on, right? So I need certain things, so I go to HR, so you have to figure that out, all right? So orientation is definitely um, a big game changer, all right? Now, how do we evaluate the effects of orientation, okay? So we look at turnover rate, of course. We look at, you know, how often people are leaving and coming to the job, okay? You want your turnover rate to be low. You don't want to have a high turnover rate. Right, because if you have a high turnover rate, you got a problem okay, within your company. Now, that's you have to take into perspective or into consideration uh, the company you're working for and what it is that the job is. Okay? McDonald's, like I said, high turnover rate, and they know that because the people that they're hiring for the job typically are younger adults, students, right, or older people who are just need something to do, right? They don't need the money. Right, but they just doing it for fun, you know, just to have keep occupied the time, but they they in and out. Okay, so you'll see a new face all the time. Okay, so turnover rate should be low uh, for most times, but it's the industry dependent, you know, fast food industry, uh, restaurant business in general. To even that. sales, even sales, yeah, has high turnover because people get burnt out. Mm -hmm. People get burnt out. They're not good at it. Not making any money. You know, it's just they have high turnover rate. Okay. Um, new hire failure factor. Okay. So I hired somebody, and a year later, 
I find out they suck. Okay, so now I've hired somebody, I'm paying them, but they're still not doing the job. And guess what? I let, I have to do the job myself, find somebody else to do it. They're not gonna let me hire somebody new in addition to, all right? And so I need to either fire this person or find somebody to do it, okay? And so when you have that problem, it, it's just a waste, okay? It really is, because now, I have a body that's not really contributing anything, right? But I'm, the money's gone. I allocated the money to this person, so I have to fire them. In a lot of instances, you just can't fire somebody like that. Right? You have to give them evaluation, counseling, and then you know say, hey, it's time to remediate, right? Do you need to go to training? Are you just not motivated? Are you just lazy? Right? You not know anything, right? There's a lot of people that go on the job, they don't know anything. Right? And they get there and they're sitting around and people are like, what, you, what, what is your job? Like, what is your function? What's your purpose? And they're like, well, I do this report. And they're like, I never seen that report before in my life. I never use this report. Why, why, why would you make this report? It doesn't add any value, right? So I had to figure that out. You got to get rid of this person and what, what you need to have. Okay? Uh, look at the employee up. Rate, right? Am I look, you know, do I look at how many employees are moving up? Right? How many get promoted from the training? Okay? Or from the orientation? Right? Again, the more likely to or to succeed if you go to orientation or you have some kind of orientation. Or in other words, if you have some sponsorship, which is another way to get orientation done, right? Who was that? That's what you were asking me about the, the training of the colleague, right? You can, they do this in orientation too, right? They'll have, you have two different people. You have one person who orientates you to the organization and you have the other person that's gonna actually train you on your skill set, okay? Because those, that person may not be the same person because that, that person who's technically sound may not be a people person, may suck at just being human, okay? And so they may not like people or whatever the case may be. So we'll have somebody you know, as a sponsor, especially if you're coming from a different country, different state, like, hey, we you know you're coming from, you know, from New York. This is something the military does. So every time I, I move stations, I move, you know, to a different state. Like I, I, I was in, my first duty station was in Hawaii. So when I got to Hawaii, there was somebody there from my department that I was going to work in, right, that came pick me up. Showed me around very quickly, took me to my room, showed me around the base very fast, and then told me where to be the next day or on Monday. Be here this time in this uniform. We good to go, right? And that person was my my sponsor. Back the issue, hey, you know, I got a problem. This is it. Okay, no problem. I think I'll help you out. I'll take care of you, right? I had somebody to go to, right? That was kind of my orientation. And then when I got to the office, then they left, they went back to they went to their job, and then the department of my media boss said, Okay, now you know we're gonna sit down, we're gonna talk, but then you're gonna start training with such and such, right? Within the department. So you can have two different people, but the orientation can be more one-on-one, -on -one, more of a sponsor type uh type deal, all right. Um, and then development program participation rate, right? How eager or how many people do we have kind of wanting to come and be trained, right? How many people want to participate in training? That says a lot about your training program and your environment um, as a corporation, right? If you have a lot of training opportunities, a lot of good, you know, things that people can learn, more likely they're going to take advantage of it, right? So if, if they were, you know, doing pre-SQL classes, somewhere, free Python or free AI or free accounting classes, right? You probably would take the training, right? If, if you're like, hey, this training is available, it's free, why not? I'll take it. Maybe it'll help me down the line get promoted or move, you know, doing the ladder move to another department, different section. They need me to be able to cross train, right? Cross training is a big deal, right? We're talking about training, right? And everybody familiar with the term cross training? No. Interdepartment? 
into the into functional into skill training, right? So basically, you know, if you're accountant, then uh, I'm gonna cross train you in procurement. Uh, huh? Procurement, maybe. Procure, yeah. I told I put you here. Yeah, I cross train you procurement because they kind of go hand in hand, sort of, right? Something like that, right? So now you have the procurement side, you have the accounting side, right? I cross train you. So if something comes up, I'm like, ah, you know, I, one of my guys is going on vacation, or my one of my guys is going to training. Can you step in for a week just to cover? Yeah. All right? Because you're cross training. Mm -hmm. Any opportunity you get to cross train, you should take it. All right? Any opportunity you get to kind of learn something new about the company, um, you should take it. Because it's going to give you a different perspective about what the company does. And it also gives you an opportunity to see, oh, maybe I might be interested in this particular aspect of the company. Right? It may have, it may have more upward mobility. And it makes you see him. Like, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Make you, exactly. Everybody like, oh, who's this guy? The captain. Oh, mm -hmm. What's he going there? And what's going to the treatment? He can do that too? Like, oh, okay. Well, cool. All right. No problem. You get you got your network, you're getting bigger, you get to meet more people. They see no, like, he's good. Can we keep him? Like, yeah, you can keep him, give him a pay raise. Yeah, okay, okay. we'll give him a pay raise. Yeah, no problem. It happens. It happens all the time. People go in the car train and go, you know, cover with somebody that you know, move department, get a fifty thousand dollar raise. Okay, I think everybody would be okay with that. All right, so we're good on that, right? All right, so now let's talk about the actual design of training. Okay, and this is more or less where we get into what I was talking about earlier with you know having the right trainer, figuring out what I need to train on. And figure out how I'm going to train, all right? What mode of delivery am I going to use? And then how am I going to evaluate the training? Okay. And so we have this little acronym or model. It's called ADDIE. Okay. And ADDIE basically assignment, design, uh, yeah, assessment, excuse me, design, development, implementation, and evaluation. All right. If you look at it, it's basically sort of kind of like the regular. Business process, problem solving type uh, process. Okay, I need to assess. Right, I'm analyzing here. Uh, I need to figure out the problem is. So let me. Okay. So when we talk about assessment, we're really talking about okay. What are what are the five W's of the assessment? Right, who needs it? Why they need it? Where am I going to do it? Okay, when am I going to do it? All right. Um, and so when I look at all those categories, I'm trying to really figure out, you know, what is my core problem? Right. It's kind of like your 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 thesis of this dissertation sort of, right? I got a I got a I got an issue. What's my problem? What's my overarching problem? All right, I gotta figure that out. And once I have my overarching problem, then I start asking specific questions. Is the whole thing broke? Is part of it broke? Which parts are good? Which parts aren't? All right? Which parts are obsolete? Which parts can I actually fix? It doesn't need to be fixed. Is the first question. All right? Just because something comes up and we assess it, doesn't necessarily mean any change. It's just an assessment to see what's going on with it. Is it still relevant? Is it still practical? Is it still cost efficient? Right, all these things that go into the assessment. Okay, so who needs to be trained? Right, who will be training? All those questions go into the assessment piece. Right, and usually you'll see training needs assessment as TNA. Right, this is quick action to TNA, but they're looking at the training needs assessment. Right, like what do we need to train on? Right, but that calls for a deeper dive into the initial goals and the mission as to where we're trying to get to. Okay, and then Taking that and comparing that to what we have. Okay. We want to be here, right? Now we're here, we want to be here. What is the gap? Okay. Where we are or where we want to be, the middle of the gap. Because there's a void, there's a space that is empty. And we need to fill that space with skills, with people with certain skill sets. What are they? That's the problem we need to figure out. And that's what the assessment is about. Okay. 
All right, so dual assessment, uh, uh, needs assessment, or right? some different areas that need to be taken care of. It looks like the job analysis. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So you can do organizational analysis, right? You can look at the very big overview of the company and do organizational analysis. You can do a job task analysis and you kind of go more into each specific job, right? And the tasks involved and the roles and responsibilities. Okay. Um, and you can do individual analysis. Each person kind of comes in and says, okay, what do you do? Okay, and then be like, great. All right, is this person necessary? Not just forget about the job. Is this person even necessary? Period. All right, I got 10 engineers. Do I need 10 engineers? Maybe I need eight. All right, I don't know. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and see what value you add, right? Is it necessary for me to have 10 based on the workload? Okay, or I can look at your performance and say, you know what? I have 10, I got to cut two. Let's see who the best performers are based on the evaluation. Okay? So you have different ways in which you can kind of figure out your needs and, and what it is you want to you wanna, you know, train to. Okay? Because you don't want to waste your time training to things that are not relevant. Right? If you, it just doesn't make any sense to train in something that you're never going to use or it's not practical. Or, excuse me, better yet, marketable, all right? Marketable skills is what people are looking for in the workplace, all right? And you have to be able to convey those marketable skills either through your know, performance, right? Um, you know, when you go look for a new job, it's written on your resume, but at the same time, you still have to assess you via interviews, all right? And try to figure out exactly what you want. When you're internal and you're in the company already, you know, sometimes they'll send you a survey questionnaire as an employee, like, tell us, you know, what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Tell us what you think needs improvement. Tell us, you know, what you think about your boss. Rate your boss on a scale of 1 to 10, right? How do you think your boss performs in communication, in performance, in evaluation, in all the different areas, right? They want to know because they want to see if this boss is effective, right? Or maybe they want to see what the boss is doing that's making the department so effective, right? If you have a killer department, if you have a, an area of the company that's doing extremely well, and you want to analyze them because you want to see what is it, what are they doing? What makes them so much better than everybody else, right? It's kind of like a sports team, right? What makes this team better than that team? Well, maybe you got Messi, maybe you got Ronaldo, maybe you got Mbappe, you maybe you got uh, some other guy, right? Who's fantastic? I don't know. Who else? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I know. I really no, no, <laughs> Neymar. All right, yeah. good like that. No, no. no. Oh, okay, okay. Let's check it. All right, hey, Neymar. Man. Yeah, I don't know. Be good. Better than me, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, I'm sure. Is this something? No, <laughs> no. My dad tried because that's what this point my dad played. He played soccer. And, you know, he grew up in the Caribbean. And soccer, you know, soccer is the number one sport in the world, so I said, pick up. I never got into it. I play cricket. You play cricket? Yeah. yeah. We, I, actually, I actually play more cricket than I play soccer. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a team member of San Diego Cricket Association. Are you? Um, oh, wow. Okay. I, and over tournament is starting from the There you go. And now we, we got to come out and watch you. <laughs> you you got to know. I like watching cricket. I like playing cricket. I've been playing a long, long time. Um, but the point is that um, you know it's it's a team, right? And so you, you compare the teams and what gets the team to perform so well? Is it leader? Is, is it the pieces that I have? Right? Is it the individual players that I have? Right? Is this player worth twenty million dollars or sixty five million dollars in transfer fees? Right? When you see the transfer fees, you're like sixty five million dollars for one guy to transfer. You know, I know what it's a trade, but that's a lot of money yeah. for one person. But that one person changes the whole profile of your team, right? Is it the manager? Is it the player? Is it the combination of both? Is it different players? Same thing. I need to know that. So I may send out a questionnaire or analysis to figure out how can I duplicate what you're doing, right? And usually boils down to personality, right? You have somebody who's just a great leader, who understands giving people space, but also the mentor, people feel comfortable around them, 
willing to talk to them. They're willing to take advice and criticism from them, all right? Because they respect them and they say, oh, you know what you're talking about, all right? This one be turned out to be at the end of the day. But I need to know that, right? So the way I kind of figure out what training I need is to say, oh, you know, I mean, he's great at, 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 you know, soccer, you know? Maybe he could be a coach. And he's a great coach. Hey, you know the coaches? Go to Nadi's class or go to, I don't know, you got to figure something out, but you talk to the man, call him tonight, okay? I want you to be just like him because I want all the teams to be really good. You know what I'm saying? So the same thing within the company. I want to emulate success. And so if I find somebody or team or, you know, group of folks that are excelling, it's not necessarily about just the product or the good of service. It's about that team and that cohesion, the synergy. The teamwork, the collaboration, the openness, the leadership. Right? It's just their vibe. Huh? Their vibe. Their vibe, right? Do we go out after work? Do you know who my wife is? Right? Not in any other nasty way. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, you know that I have kids. Would you know what I do after class, right? Okay? This is why I ask you all these questions sometimes. Like, hey, what are you doing the weekend? You guys going anywhere? Like, where do you go? You been here? I ask this question because I'm curious about what it is you guys do. I just know you play cricket. I didn't know. Who knew? All right? I didn't know. Okay. I'm apparently a great football player. <laughs> <laughs> All right? I'm not. No, no, yeah, you know. You're probably as good as I am in basketball. Okay? I used, to, I used to be a good basketball player. Okay? Yeah, yeah I, I really was. I was good. But I'm not good anymore. Okay, I'm old now. I'm back. Back. <laughs> yeah, this is why why I'm not old. All right, but at the same time, you young, you guys got so much space and time. Please, you guys got so much time. Okay, you, still, you, you don't look like old. Yeah. If I you're gonna be a teacher, you're gonna be like same as yeah. 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 I know that. No, he's not young. He's not young. <laughs> he's got his yeah. 15. Yeah, he's not a young guy <laughs> at all. All right. Um, so we talked about the gap already, right? The distance between where the organization is and uh, with the employees and where it wants to be, okay? And that's what the training is trying to fill. We're trying to fill that gap, right? Because we have a vision as a CEO, as a leadership, as to where we want to go. And so what skill set do we need to get there, right? Um, the training can focus on knowledge, skills, and attitude, right? Uh, I would tell you that this part here is the hardest thing to fix. Attitude, yeah. The knowledge and skills, easy. Attitude, no, no. It's not. It's not easy to fix. We have a lot of issues with that. Okay. All right. So learning characteristics. All right. Uh, first thing, when you when you are, you know, here as an instructor, I'm I'm happy and I feel good because. When I walk into the class and I see the students in Zoom or in the class, I know you guys are here because you want to be here, because you want to learn, okay? There's different situations where you force people to go to training and they don't want to be there, okay? If they don't want to be there, it makes it harder for them to learn because their attitude is not right, okay? Um, their motivation is off, okay? Um, a lot of times, the ability to learn is not there, but it's because they're, they're just not really put any effort in it. Okay. Because if you are certain, if you are in a certain training, you now, and I'm talking about like after you got your job and you're doing some you know, training for your job, you can learn. You're, you're smart enough to learn whatever it is because it's related to your job. But if you don't want to be there and somebody made you go with mandatory training, it tends to like fall flat. Okay, even the HR mandatory training is just one of those things where people come, they sit down, and they're busy, they're doing other things, and I'm just talking. And it, just, it is what it is, you know. It's just like it, it really is a check in the box to make sure, like, hey, you had this training, we have it recorded here this date, your name's right here because we're going to sign attendance. And then if something happens, you do something dumb, and they come to us and try to sue us, like, no, we trained them, he knew better. Not on us. Sorry, we train them. Okay, but if you don't, if you're not motivated to learn, then you're not gonna. 
you're not going to take a whole. You have to be motivated and want to do that. Okay. Um, all right. All right. So the only thing I want you to remember about this would be self efficacy. Okay. So self efficacy is basically the belief in your own abilities. Okay. How much confidence do I have in what I'm doing and what I can do? Okay. Now, when you're in your particular skill, you guys are here, you know, you get your MBA, but you guys have other degrees that you're proficient and you're good at, right? You have a high self efficacy. You know, hey, you put this in front of me, it has to do with my job, I got it, I'm knocking it out of the park, okay? I take you someplace else, though, and we have to do something that none of us have done before. I don't know, like nursing, I don't know, right? Our self efficacy is low. Because we don't have any confidence in what we're doing, because we don't know it, we don't understand it, right? So your self-efficacy really has a lot to do with your learning, because you have to have a belief in yourself that doesn't matter how complicated it is, you know you can figure it out, right? Now, that's not to say you will figure it out, because there's a lot of things that I've learned that I still haven't figured out. Yeah, I'm just like I don't know. I don't understand it. I don't think I will ever understand it. And it's in the world of statistics, and I don't I'm like. I hope that God never have to teach this because this is some really complicated stuff, and I don't understand how you guys even thought of this. I don't know who thought of this stuff, right? You're not, but I want to learn it. I tried, but I just don't have the capacity unless I really sit down and really cut it up in small pieces and have somebody explain to me at a very fundamental level. I'm not gonna get it, all right? But I have the motivation and I have the self efficacy to know that, hey, I believe in my abilities to learn, all right? So if I believe in my abilities to learn, then I'm okay. Learning style, definitely, as I said before, you know, everybody has a different learning style, all right? Some are auditory, some are tactile, some are visual. Most of us are a combination of visual and tactile, right? Most men are very visual, right? We're visual type people. All right, and so we like to see things, we like to touch things, we like to do stuff. And you learn better when you are doing it, all right? This is why, this is why gaming and simulation are a big deal, okay? Because remember when I talked about gaming before? It was a simulation, right? Simulation, did I talk about No, that's not that. I don't think I'm talking about the gaming degree. No, gaming degree is not. No, I'm not talking about tonight. Before, you know, talk about gaming. No. no, I don't think so. I think it was my past class. I heard you said that this is not class. Okay. So gaming, gaming and simulations are important for training because they give you the opportunity to do whatever it is you want to do, and you're going to make mistakes but not necessarily suffer the consequences. <laughs> like remember, yeah, like the oh, so I did talk about it, like the pilot, right? So flight simulator. This is why pilots get on flight simulators first. They don't get in the air and just go again. Simulators and flight simulators for a long time, you know, you know, it might be very sophisticated flight simulators, but they start on the computer first, then it, they graduate to the big, you know, model with the thing and like a like a ride at the action parks, you know, doing all the stuff, weather and all that stuff. But they make mistakes, they crash 10 times a day, but they're still alive to talk about it. Okay. So when you have training, you can do simulations or or gaming you know, type uh, stuff, it helps because people get to experience all the things they would normally experience um, in if it was real life, right, but not suffer the consequences. The only thing you really can't simulate is sometimes you can't really simulate the speed or the emotion that goes with certain things, right? You can practice all day, but when you practice, you're practicing against your other teammate. It's different when you're playing the team, another team, right? With folks that you've been studying and kind of learning how they play, learning their defense, their offense, and all that stuff, and then being used to the speed they're going at, right? We don't have somebody that's faster on our team, or maybe we have somebody that's bigger on our team or faster, or whatever the case may be, right? That's why you practice and you try to fix those deficiencies, all right? But that's what really, you know, different types of learning uh, come into play, all right? All right. Um, okay, 
So I was talking about transfer before, okay? So we're looking for training transfer, right? We're looking to see if the material that we just spoke about that I just taught you, did you actually learn it, right? Or did you just memorize it, dump it, once you were done with the exam, you got a certification and now you have no idea, you can't remember anything about it, right? Now there's some situations where that's okay, right? There's some situations where you, you go pump and dump, right? You remember it, you take the test, boom, forget about it, all right? There's other situations that if you go to training, I need you to remember it, I need you to apply it as soon as you come into the office, like right? the next week. Okay, you learned, like I said, how to build an access database. Well, we have a project here, it needs an access database. There you go, start cranking, right? Now, granted, I understand you just learned it. You're not an expert. Um, you know, you got the foundation of it all, depending on how long the training was for, right? But you have reference material to go back to, right? But I need to see if learning was transferred, right? If you actually picked up on anything. And if you didn't pick up on anything, I'm going to notice. I'm going to know right away because it's going to be evident in your work. Right? And that's the main thing we're looking for. We're looking for transferring, right? In any academic or learning situation, any learning situation, I'd say, I'm looking for transfers, looking for to, to see the, the knowledge transferred and you can apply it to what you're doing in your day to day activities, whatever responsibilities you have. Right, that's what we're looking for. Make sure that you understand that the, the training was important, and that you actually took, you know, took away what I wanted you to learn, and that you're going to build on it. Okay, because that's really what you're doing here in school. Right, the transfer training, the transfer learning is happening, but I'm not going to really know if you learn anything till you get out in the real world. Right, yes, the tasks and the quiz and all that stuff. Is to somewhat you know transfer related but at the end of the day it's going to be measured by your success out there in the real world mm -hmm. right in your job and being able to say yes i took an hr class and i understand hr at a general level i understand that there are you know this title um title uh you know, I can't remember. title nine right the title seven right there's, there's different laws that uh, adhere to discrimination against age or race or religion. I understand HR to a certain degree, right? And someone, you're not going to come tell me this and, and think I'm going to believe you because I know that's not true, right? That's, I would talk something different, right? That's that's one way to apply it, you understand? So, so that people understand that, okay, so you know a little bit about HR, okay, so I can't really mess with you too much, okay? You know a little bit about procurement, Right, also you can cover okay, cool. And you may not know everything, but you know enough to be dangerous, right? We're looking always for the transfer of training, okay? All right, let's see what's on here. Oh, all right, that's all we got. Any questions? Yeah, all right, make sure you go uh, back and read, um, look over a chapter. <laughs> I want to say six, six and seven, I believe. There's a few more slides left. Make sure you just peruse them, take a look at them. Chapter six talks about stuff we talked about last week as far as talent management and that kind of thing. Um, this chapter is more about training and um, how to uh, assess training and get yourself set up from an HR perspective, okay? So that's all I got. Make sure you get your... Um, your LEN, I see a lot of people already got theirs in. Cool. I appreciate that. That's early. Case study, get that in. If you have any issues with your team, uh, email them. CC me on everything if you're having problems with your team. Okay. Get in contact with your group mates. All right. And don't let them chase you down. You already fought with them. Okay, good. As long as you guys figured it out. Okay. I can be submit by the end of this week, right? Sunday, 11.59. Uh, yes. The case Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So, yeah, so we did. Okay, that's it. I'll see you guys next week, okay? Yeah. All right, Zoom. I'll see you guys next week.
Thank you, Professor. See you next week. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Yeah, it's okay. We can. We can.